Welcome, everyone. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. We call to mind our sins. Lord Jesus, you were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You intercede for us at the right hand of God. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose, grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to Shebna, master of the palace, I will thrust you from your office and pull you down from your station. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and gird him with your sash and give over to him your authority. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder. When he opens, no one shall shut. When he shuts, no one shall open. I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. The word of the Lord. The responsorial psalm is, Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart, for you have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels, I will sing your praise. I will worship at your holy temple. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I will give thanks to your name because of your kindness and your truth. When I called, you answered me. You built up strength within me. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The Lord is exalted, yet the lowly he sees and the proud he knows from afar. Your kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your hands. Lord, your love is eternal. Do not forsake the work of your hands. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. In the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how inscrutable are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? 
or who has given the Lord anything that he may be repaid. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God be with you. A proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said and replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. The scriptures today, particularly the second reading and the gospel, I think draw us into what I'm going to describe as the threefold dynamic of discipleship, a dynamic that repeats itself over and over again in the life of people who are followers of Jesus. And that dynamic is disclosure, confession, and consequences. We see it play out Uh, as I said, in these two scripture readings, particularly as it leads up to Peter's confession of faith. And to feel the full force of this, we have to situate Peter's confession. It comes just a little more than halfway through the Gospel of Matthew. And before this happens, Peter is witness to the following kinds of things. Several different occasions on which Jesus heals someone. Peter is there when Jesus walks on the water. Peter is there when Jesus calms the storm. Peter is there when Jesus, not once but twice, feeds large crowds with just a few loaves and fish. These are all signs that are given by God through Jesus that are meant to be interpreted. And Peter is aided in his interpretation of what these signs mean by the teaching that accompanies so much of them, perhaps most prominently the Sermon on the Mount. So all of these things Peter has experienced and is wrestling with what they might mean with respect to the kingdom and what they might mean with respect to who is this Jesus. So that when we get to this gospel story, all these prior disclosures, all these things through the grace of God, and Jesus says, who do you say that I am, all of a sudden that grace of God kicks in again. And Peter connects the dots, looks back on all of that and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm pretty convinced that even though Peter made that confession at that time, he didn't fully understand what he was confessing to. He would be invited to say who Christ was over and over again. But having made that confession, then Peter 
uh, had to accept the consequences of that. First and foremost, perhaps, the consequences were increased responsibility for the mission of Jesus. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Along with that responsibility comes a confrontation with his own human frailty. I have to wonder if by the time we get to the end of the gospel, Peter looks back on this confession in the light of denying Jesus three times, confronted with his own human frailty. And then the realization that if, in fact, he is to be a faithful disciple, he will have to take up his cross and follow in Christ's footsteps. And we'll hear that next week. So we see in Peter, who is a kind of... um, model for the disciples, we see this dynamic of discipleship play out. Disclosure, the grace of God. Interpretation that leads to confession, also through the grace of God. And then meeting the consequences. And we should probably close the loop and say that also happens through the grace of God. So this was Matthew's version for Peter and the disciples. How might this play out for us today? in our place and time. What might that look like? And it just so happens that there were a series of events this past week that at the time I didn't realize were dots that would be connected. But I think the contours of this threefold dynamic show themselves in this process. And so I'm going to share that with you. On Monday of this week, I had a conversation with a man very serious about his faith. And he said, you know, I have been wrestling with what it means to recognize Christ. How can I recognize Christ? And he said, I've been drawn to uh, Matthew's gospel, the judgment scene where Jesus says, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. We all know that familiar story. And he said, I am struck by the fact that those who didn't provide food or drink didn't realize it was Jesus they were helping. And... I pointed out to the man, but you know what? Neither did those who were saved. And he was stopped in his tracks and he said, I never thought about that before. That gives me pause. And I said, as a matter of fact, it gives me pause too because it shrouds the recognition of Christ in an overarching mystery, huh? doesn't it? Like that second reading says, who knows the mind of God, how unsearchable his ways, inscrutable his judgments. So that was the first point. The next day, it just so happened as I was preparing to comment on these readings, I heard Peter's confession, or the question posed to Peter, who do you say that I am? And I felt that question was being posed directly to me. And then by extension, directly to all of us. How do we answer that question in our place and time? And later on that day, at our staff meeting, I discovered that in the news there was a report of a priest from Findlay who had been arrested for sexual trafficking. And we were all downcast as a result of that. As we move to Wednesday, the dots are being marked. And I rose early to reflect on the scripture for the morning mass. I discovered that the prophet Ezekiel was taking the shepherds of his day to task. He was saying, you are not very good shepherds at all. You don't care for the people. You care only for yourselves. And the story of the priest from Finley was resonating in the back of my brain. And I remembered a conversation I had with a man about a year and a half ago who said to me that he was struggling to stay part of the church because of what had happened in the whole clergy sexual abuse crisis. And so I reflected to the folks on Wednesday morning and said, you know, we have to consider what we heard in the news yesterday together with what Ezekiel said and recognize that the church needs good shepherds. We need good pastors and we need to pray for good pastors. And immediately after that short homily, I stepped back here and I looked toward the front of the church and in walked a man that I hadn't seen for months, but I recognized immediately. And all of a sudden, for me, 
the dots got connected. And it led me to a confession of faith. Two confessions of faith, actually. Who do you say that I am? Well, I found myself saying, as I look at that reading from Matthew about feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty, those people aren't Jesus, but they're brothers and sisters of Jesus. And as I see them, then I recognize Jesus as brother to the least among us. And I'll say that about Jesus. Jesus is brother to the least among us. And just as if someone did an act of kindness for my brother, I would experience him as doing it for me. So I think that's kind of what is at play in that reading. But at the very same time, I heard the resonance of my prayer saying, we need good shepherds. We need good shepherds. And I found myself standing here saying, wait a minute, I'm a shepherd. I'm the pastor of this parish. And if I confess Jesus as good shepherd and I share in his ministry, then there's consequences to that kind of confession, isn't there? The consequence is that I have to assume more responsibility for the mission that I have been given. I have to address this man after Mass. I knew I would have to address him and have a conversation with him. He's a needy person. I knew that I would be confronted with my own human frailty because I must confess that when a person comes repeatedly and sometimes uh, seeking assistance, my, the first thing that wells up in me is not always a ready spirit of generosity. And I have to confront that in myself. I have to confront that in myself. And I know that because this will happen again and again, that that may be part of the cross that happens for me as I strive to be a faithful disciple. So at the time that these events were unfolding in their singularity, I didn't see how they were connected. But the minute that man walked through the door, there was another disclosure that the grace of God was providing for me about what discipleship would mean for me. But as I mentioned, this repeats itself in the life of the disciple. So the story wasn't over. The next day, on Thursday, I received a call from a woman who told me her name and I didn't recognize it. And she said, you and I and my husband were part of the teen retreats at our home parish 45 plus years ago. I said, okay. And she mentioned several names that we knew in common. And she said, uh, my husband has been in intensive care at Cleveland Clinic for the last 86 days. And she went on to describe what he was facing. And she said, we asked another priest to come, but something got in the way. And I know, she said this, I know that there are restrictions about who can visit and how, but the hospital said that they could make a compassionate exception because he asked for you by name 45 plus years ago. And once again, those dots got connected. What does a good shepherd do in this scenario? If Jesus is brother to the sick, as well as the hungry and the thirsty, what is a confession of faith that acknowledges that? What does that imply for someone who embraces that confession as his or her own? So I went. I went, confronting my responsibility, exceptional in this circumstance. I went fully aware of my frailty and realizing that uh, there was an element of the cross in all of this. Now please be mindful that I'm suggesting that this dynamic of discipleship is not unique to Peter. It's not unique to people who are in roles of leadership, but I'm suggesting that it's what we as disciples of Jesus experience over and over and over again if we are attentive to it and if we are willing to go with where it leads us. To be attentive to the disclosures that come. We might not always realize how they're connected. To the confession that we are led to as a result of those disclosures and a willingness to accept the consequences. It's quite a journey 
to say it's quite a journey. I'm sure that you probably have had experiences like that in your own life. But maybe by articulating this threefold dynamic, it will attune all of us to how that continues to happen in us over and over and over again through the grace of God. Together, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became human. For our sake he was crucified under conscious power, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let us offer our prayers. That Francis, our Pope, and Edward, our Bishop-elect, echoing the voices of Peter, may proclaim the faith with humility and listen to the faithful with charity. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who hold the keys of authority in the world may open doors that lead to peace, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For victims of clergy sexual abuse, that they may find the loving, healing hand of God, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those bound by political repression may work in nonviolent ways to pull down systems of oppression, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who suffer and so question the ways of God may find in us some sign of the glory of the cross, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the people of Our Lady of the Lake and St. Jerome parishes, as we join together in unity, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That this assembly's profession of faith in Jesus may be made in deeds that build up the church, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died in Christ may live forever with God, especially for Richard R. Lessig, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. O holy God, you who disclose yourself to us in mysterious and often unnoticed ways, open our eyes and hearts that we might confess your presence among you and be drawn more deeply into the service of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.
Pray now, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to our ever-living God. O Lord, who gained for yourself a people by adoption through the one sacrifice offered once for all, bestow graciously on us, we pray, the gifts of unity and peace in your church. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy, for you are the one God living and true, existing before all ages and abiding for all eternity, dwelling in unapproachable light. Yet you, who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessings and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them, we too confess your name and exultation, giving voice to every creature under heaven as we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great, and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You formed us in your own image and entrusted the whole world to our care, so that in serving you alone, the Creator, we might have dominion over all creatures. And when, through disobedience, we had lost your friendship, you did not abandon us to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught us to look forward to salvation. And you so loved the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior, Made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, may this same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings, that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the celebration of this great mystery which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood the sacrifice acceptable to you which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, 
and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, we may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant Francis, our Pope, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful God, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Joseph, her spouse, with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And now with confidence, we pray in the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Offer to those around you now a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Again, we ask you to please be mindful of our communion procedure. We ask that everyone receive communion in the hand, that as you approach the communion minister, you keep your mask on until after you have said amen, and then step to your right or to your left, assume the host and return to your place, and all the while doing your best to maintain appropriate social distancing.
Take and eat, take and eat. This is my body given up for you. Take and drink, take and drink. This is my blood given up for you. spoke and light was made. I am the seed that died to be reborn. I am the bread that comes from heaven above. I am the vine that fills your cup with joy. Take and eat, take and eat. This is my body given up for you. Take and drink, take and drink. This is my blood given up for you. I am the way that leads the exile home. I am the truth that sets the captive free. I am the life that raises up the dead. I am your peace, true peace my gift to you. Take and eat, take and eat. This is my body given up for you. Let us pray. Complete within us, O Lord, the healing work of your mercy and graciously perfect and sustain us so that in all things we may please you through Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you again for your cooperation in these pandemic procedures. Uh, and just as a point of information, I believe this is the largest weekend assembly that we've had since we reopened. There's 64 people here tonight. So it's, uh, as our numbers increase, your cooperation is going to be increasingly important. So thank you for that. Please remember that all the east side doors of the church are open as you exit, maintaining social distancing. May God be with you. Amen. And may Almighty God bless all of us. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mass has ended now. Go in peace to love and to serve our God. Amen.